Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, welcome again to uh, another session. This is the fourth of uh, River Escape series, and uh, I would like to extend very warm greetings to everyone attending uh, on behalf of uh, Wednesdays for Water, uh, which is an initiative of the w for w Foundation, a think tank instituted as, an, uh, as a citizen's collective. And uh, we are very happy to announce this is the 100th session of Wednesdays for Water today. So, um, and, uh, and the objective of Wednesdays for Water is to engage in uh, conversation with water experts, grassroots practitioners, policy makers, and youth to explore the complex intertwined relation uh, issues associated uh, with water and possible solutions. We have expanded since then uh, uh, to have more activities like Friday Waters and Monday Munching with Women for Waters beside organizing water workshops, water walks and talks, seminars, special courses and conference panels to continue the water conversation in various possible ways. Uh, please visit uh, the website and uh, it's there in the chat box already. The details are there. Uh, uh, the reason why we are collaborating together is pretty much what I just explained. Uh, the passion for w for w Foundation for uh, rivers and waters and our theme for uh, Ecomos India Central Zone, which was Riverscapes this year, um, made it very much obvious for us to collaborate on this. And hence, we are very happy that this is the fourth uh, panel and discussion around Riverscapes. Uh, today's session is part of this uh, series, larger series, and where we want to focus on the cultural connections of the Riverscapes particularly. And uh, what we wanted to look at this six session series is to recognize the significance of waterways, their evolution and impact on socio-cultural aspect of the community, and to uh, encourage individuals in conserving this intensive and extensive resource. Uh, this series is conducted uh, 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 by both of us in a joint partnership together, Ecomos India and w for w uh, to moderate uh, this session, I am here myself, Nishant Upadhyay. I am representing uh, Central Zone of uh, Ecomos India at this point. And, uh, and uh, otherwise, I, I am also the founder of a, a consultancy called Dharatal. And, uh, and thank you all for joining, of course. And um, then for another, uh, we have a, a speaker, one of the panelists, we have Nupur. Uh, who uh, Nupur Bhatnagar. So as you can see, uh, Nupur can wave. And Nupur has been uh, a heritage enthusiast way before being a qualified architect. Uh, she has worked on conservation and documentation projects in North India and Cambodia, uh, currently pursuing her master's in architectural design and history in Milan, Italy, while working on her thesis titled Conservation and Management of Water Heritage Sites in India. Uh, during her entire professional journey, she has been very well, uh, uh, you know, kind of attached and uh, uh, been working constantly in water uh, sector, particularly. So I uh, also look at this opportunity to connect uh, these heritage individuals with the w for w network. And, uh, and through, through research and developing illustrations, she has been a part of the book Top 10 Baulis of Delhi by Niyogi Books, published in 2019, uh, part of ICOMOS India's Water Heritage Working Group since its inception. She has worked for the proposed documentation framework, which we are going to discuss today uh, in a very interesting, uh, the ideology and the approach water sites for their comprehensive value. Uh, this project is also part of one of the ICOMOS India initiative where uh, they propose that young researchers and emerging professionals uh, come up with the ideas, which uh, research project, which they can take up and um, uh, from the East Zone, both uh, uh, and Water Working Group, uh, Nupur and Sukrit have been uh, uh, together uh, involved with the project. Uh, the other panelist uh, whom we have uh, Sukrit here and uh, is uh, basically Sukrit is from Kolkata uh, uh, and is a heritage manager by profession and a musician by passion. I think he's more of a musician in my opinion and, uh, and a fantastic one. He's trained in tabla and Indian percussion instrument and has been associated with Indian classical music for over two decades. And given his background in music and architecture, Sukrit has taken keen interest in linkages between tangible and intangible heritage, exploring them to engage 
with the communities and have a more holistic outlook towards heritage conservation strategies. Um, in this uh, approach, this approach informs his recent engagement with disaster management, observing the role of traditional knowledge and other intangible aspects uh, in risk okay. reduction practices. And uh, Sukrit is currently associated with the Living Waters M Museum and ICROM, and uh, he has contributed to several national and international projects and conferences and holds a number of uh, academic publications to his credit. And uh, to also uh, just uh, congratulate Sukrit and everyone, uh, the World Music Day, which is uh, today. Also. <laughs> so just to uh, take it further and without further ado, I would like the panelists. Uh, let's to not forget over. Yoga Day as well, which was kind of very conveniently taken over. <laughs> Yes, yes, very much. <laughs> so, so there's an International Day of Yoga also, which also Sukhri pointed oh, out. Yet, so it's good. Yes, <laughs> uh, so we should, uh, the whole holistic, the fluidity and everything is coming together. So please, Sukhri and Nupur, please take it forward. Um, all right, I will just share the presentation screen. I hope everything is visible. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everyone. So, um, as heavy as the title sounds, our work is not as uh, you know, like it's not that complicated in itself. It's a more simplistic approach that, um, like Nishant very correctly said, young researchers and uh, youth is actually trying to not simplify technical things, but try to approach the things in the way that we can understand it. Um, so this session is mainly talking about the work that we have uh, done till now and it's sort of an ongoing project with respect to um, what is water heritage and how can we actually define it or document it. So um, one, three of the main questions that we're trying to answer in this uh, session today are um, what is water heritage? Um, basically any, any um, historic element which is surrounded by a water element. So what is more important here is to emphasize that, that it can be built and natural both. Um, the other thing is why? Why are we talking specifically about water heritage? And here it is because we want to um, approach the current specific challenges related to water, water with the help of uh, culture and cultural heritage. Um, the third point being how, and this is where our um, uh, documentation and uh, I'm just going to move the screen away so that I'm not sure if the entire slide is visible. Okay. Does this help? Yeah. Uh, okay, perfect. Yes. So the, the final step being uh, how. So uh, this is where we are actually trying to do the project. So I'm just going to quickly elaborate in a very brief way, actually, what Water Heritage actually means. And um, the sketch, I am going to move the bar again just to focus a little more on the sketch. Uh, it was actually very interesting because we were having this conversation about how to define water heritage and specifically water heritage within the Indian context. And this illustration is actually AI generated. And the simpler keywords that were given was water heritage in India. And if you notice, it was a very, it's, it's a very unique picture because on the left portion, it actually tried to show us more natural uh, landscapes through like these very, um, very natural embankments in the form of contoured forests. Then it tried to combine a very Buddhist looking stupa with these uh, pal palatial structures, which we see very similar uh, along the ghats of Varanasi, along the ghats of River Ganga and Varanasi. So this sketch actually became a very simple definition of what water heritage in India could actually mean. And uh, another important factor being that the people are in the boats inside. So uh, that is the most important element that we have also kind of um, made sure to include when we were explaining what water heritage means. Uh, one more important fact, which has been considered while we were working on this, that um, the, the diversity of what water heritage could be in India is as diverse as the geography of India and as diverse as its his history. So we have structures which range in its function from uh, for, for water supply systems, for flood controls as dams and hydraulic bridges. 
then um, the simpler waterscapes that we see along the rivers of India, uh, the urban deltas and how the rivers actually uh, shape the uh, urban fabric of our cities and metropolitans. And one interesting fact being the cosmological sites. Uh, for example, um, if we read uh, further, the, the, the instruments at Jantan Mante have a very uh, intricate system of hydraulic uh, chains and how the, these devices would actually work with the help of water element. Okay, so um, the other aspect that we were talking about, like why, why, why are we focusing on water heritage? Uh, the main reason here is that we're trying to reimagine these historic sites also as water resources to establish this acknowledgement that they are not simply just historic sites of architectural relevance, but also an important water resource. Um, this is mainly to approach several like important topics or important, uh, let's say, challenges that we are facing today with respect to current and future water needs, uh, approaching water scarcity and water conservation issues. Uh, another important aspect being that understanding what water heritage means could actually help us to establish sustainable water, water management systems, taking references from the traditional water, uh, water management systems that they've had in India for a very long time, and use these for establishing better planning policies and development programs for water stressed areas in our country, which also happen to um, collide with uh, historic cities where the, the, uh, with the, where the center of the town or where the historic parts of the towns are overpopulated, have higher water needs as compared to the other parts of the city. Another important aspect being that the traditional water systems actually help us to understand the accessibility of water across different classes, across different genders, and making water available for everybody. And um, the third most important part being to preserve the cultural and natural water environments. Uh, where we are also talking about uh, the risk resilience for built heritage sites from water itself. Um, for example, the, the, current, the current challenges that certain, water, uh, certain heritage sites face from floods and how these can be combat uh, in a better way, specifically in cases of water heritage sites. Um, so coming to the documentation framework itself, the framework is actually the first step of the how. Because, um, of course, the eventual goal is to um, establish a better conservation and management practice for water heritage sites. But the first step itself means how can we define what constitutes as a water heritage site? And how can we document it in order to ensure that every associated attribute to that site is uh, recorded and is considered while we are uh, while we're conserving and protecting it, while we're using it for a better um, uh, development program. So, um, as part of this, uh, as part of the process of this um, uh, developing this documentation framework, the initial, the first step, which actually took our entire team a quite long time, to be honest, was uh, trying to study the existing uh, documentation frameworks that we have, specifically with regards to architectural sites, with regards to water resources, with regards to intangible cultural heritage resources. And then it was a very long process of understanding what the gaps are when it comes to a specifically water heritage site, because we were unable to find a very specific documentation framework with, which was just a water heritage site, which is why we are now creating this. Uh, the second step was to understand how these gaps can be filled by adding new attributes to the existing framework. So here we are just trying to, um, let's say, collate and combine the documentation frameworks in different disciplines and bridge the gaps by not actually creating a new framework altogether, but actually combining and creating a framework just out of what already exists. Um, the third step was trying to understand what are the most important values, what are the most important elements associated to a water heritage site. Uh, which included understanding the socio-cultural significance, the natural, sig natural and environmental significance, the architectural and scientific contributions of that site, the historical and sustenance uh, references, uh, susten um, the historical references of the site, and what the site itself as a sustenance resource. Um, when we sort of actually sat down to develop the framework, 
One important aspect of it was to understand that we need a multidisciplinary team. Like we need people from different discourses. We need people from uh, different backgrounds to understand that um, this, this entire process needs to be thorough in, in every associated uh, value that we mentioned in the previous uh, process. So um, this is when we actually try to invite um, uh, the EPWG team from East India, and we tried to work with uh, professionals who were, again, within the uh, conservation background, but through uh, in, in, in natural uh, conservation, people from planning departments, uh, people who were in, in touch with stakeholders, in touch with public organizations and uh, private organizations who've been working around this theme. And eventually we were able to create a framework which is more like a toolkit, which you actually take to the side. And um, the, the testing of this toolkit is what is actually making us, uh, helping us to finish this uh, framework. Because with each side that this toolkit is actually tested upon, we understand the attributes better. We understand uh, if there are any gaps in the existing framework, what are the other things that can be added in the framework and which kind of um, stakeholders and which kind of, team members do we actually need to completely fill this framework? Um, so as far as uh, showcasing the entire framework is concerned, uh, because it's actually a, a work in progress and due to, due to certain copyright issues, because it's an e-commerce India project and which will be uploaded on the public platform um, eventually once it's finished and pretty soon actually uh, in September. But uh, here we actually tried to enlist the, the main attributes or the main categories under which the framework actually works, um, which includes the, the general characteristics of the general identity of the uh, water heritage site, its um, natural and environmental values and elements, then the, the cultural uh, aspects in terms of the built elements of the site, then the social and the intangible uh, cultural aspects of the site. And eventually the two most important parts being the risk analysis of the water heritage site and the risk and analysis of the social and intangible cultural heritage associated with it. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, Sukrit to continue from here. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Nupur. I will request you to kindly just control the slides so I can just maybe uh, keep speaking. So I think yeah, thank uh, you so much. Uh, Please continue. when Nupur and I, we were discussing for a very long time as a part of the Water Heritage uh, Working Group that, you know, this is a kind of a requirement where we have what we know, what is water heritage. We kind of know why we are kind of segregating this as a separate attribute. Uh, but I think one gap that we definitely realized was how are we supposed to uh, document this uh, water heritage or when we document water heritage are, you know, are these elements doc uh, documented at all? We had several meetings with other members of our team and they also kind of, you know, added to these uh, questions that we kind of put down together and, you know, taking everything in consideration, we listed down this toolkit. And I think that is when, you know, we also propose that from Living Waters Museum, we are also kind of developing uh, an exhibition on the different water, the, the waters of Calcutta. We have named this exhibition Jol Janta Kolkata, which means literally the living waters of Calcutta. Uh, and we were also kind of documenting different kind of, you know, water stories from the city. And the ghats actually uh, were one of the most important um, aspects because that was the element from where uh, we started. And uh, while we kind of discussed that, you know, we need a multidisciplinary angle to understanding or interpreting these ghats, uh, we kind of brought in a team of young professionals and students uh, from Omdal College of Architecture to kind of reimagine uh you know uh, the stories that we tell about these cards and also look at it from more um one on one side definitely from a more democratic process so that it's easier for everyone to understand but also bring also present it in a very technical manner so that it's actually useful when we're actually doing conservation works on these uh, things and that is where i think the ghats kind of you know ca came as a very good case study this image has been created by um, a very able conservation architect who was you know uh, who was also working with us throughout the project devashita kundu and we've had a poet actually write poetry uh, and after seeing all these images, again, to give in a multidisciplinary uh, angle. But when we were documenting these things with the students, we thought that why don't we actually use the framework itself 
to kind of test when we are documenting. You know, we've sketched the guards, we've, we've written poetry about it, but let's actually test the framework to actually see what the problems are. And we did find a lot of problems. And the main idea behind this was also to actually find these problems, which we will be discussing as we proceed. Um, so we've had uh, some fine, actually second year students who have been working uh, with us on this on this project where we've been going to some very, uh, you know, uh, not so well known parts of Calcutta to understand its architectural patterns, to understand its relationship with the river uh, and of course its history and its relevance in current times. Uh, so I thought that why don't we actually in, in, uh, invite the students themselves to kind of come and speak. Uh, so can I have uh, Shohini Ghosh on screen? Are you there? Shohini, are you there? Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Shohini Ghosh. I'm from Omdal uh, College of Architecture, second year. Perfect. So we were talking about the one of the ghats that we kind of talked about was the Hura Chandra Mulli Ghat. Again, a ghat that's literally hidden and not not a lot of people don't know about this ghat, but it's very unique in its own place. So Shohini, can you please uh, you know tell us about your experience while doing this? Yes, uh, this ghat is probably built around 19th century and lost with time. Uh, this is very much renowned as a private ghat. This ghat was constructed by Mr. Hurashandra Mollik, under whose name there is a street at Shobha Bajar. Uh, there is also a history behind the name of this ghat. This ghat is uh, uh, historically famous as Rottola Ghat because there was a, a person named Shobharam Boshak whose roth was kept there. Currently, this ghat is under maintenance by Kolkata Port Trust, KOPT, and there's also a local committee who looks up the cleanliness of the ghat. Uniqueness of this ghat includes that, uh, upper, uh, like unlike the other ghats, this ghat comprises of a viewing deck, along with those uh, male and female changing rooms there are there also. And lastly, the users comprises regular bathers, local pujaris, and a local committee, as I mentioned, local committee members. Thank you. Thank you, Shohini. As you can see, uh, this is actually the framework, a glimpse of the framework that we were using to kind of uh, put in all the details and literally whatever we see. So it includes flora, fauna, it includes people, it includes intangible cultural heritage, it includes uh, like not intangible cultural heritage, but of course the social practices that are a part of it. Uh, but of course, architecture is also a very important part of the entire documentation, uh, which we will also hear. Is, is Shomeshwar Banerjee in the meeting? Uh, yes, Dada. Yes. Can we talk about the architectural, uh, uh, you know, elements of this, of this uh, uh, ghat? Yes, well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Shomeshwar from Omdal Group of Institution, College of Engineering and Architecture, um, second year student. Um, the most unique feature of this ghat is that the viewing deck as most of the carts which we can find around that they are directly access to the waters uh, through the stairs but this cart has a uh, viewing deck in the middle and it's kind of a private cart and uh, the viewing deck separates the cart from the male and the female aspect uh, that the one side is accessible for the males and the other side is for the female and the and the typical feature of this guard is its elevation that we can find the uh, curvilinear vaulted uh, roof uh, which gives a very unique feature uh, to, the, uh, to this ghat and and the iron frameworks and the iron frameworks of this ghat also creates a uh, very good approach in the front facade okay Thank you. So I think, uh, so while we take the students, the idea is also to kind of, you know, not just ask them to do the work, but the idea is also telling them these elements and making them think behind why a certain space is like that. And what is the difference between a public heart and maybe a private uh, heart. But then the in main reason why we are documenting these things and also kind of uh, un understanding the risk uh, un aspects of these of these cards. Uh, where actually the water comes in, which actually is a main element which you often tend to miss out on, is uh, the river itself, which flows right next to the ghat. 
And as we see that, you know, while if we talk about the physical vulnerability, we have kind of listed down four types of vulnerabilities. One is physical vulnerabilities, social vulnerabilities, institutional vulnerabilities, and of course, other, uh, you know, um, vulnerabilities that are there from the, in the vicinity. So if we talk about the physical vulnerabilities, we see that the river, since it's a very active river, the Hooghly, although we know that most of its water come into Calcutta because of the Faraka barrage, uh, but Hooghly is still a very, you know, it's a river with a very high flow. And due to this continuous motion, which is kind of continuously hitting this ghat in a certain way, we do see uh, that this building is definitely uh, vulnerable to structural damage. And due to lack of maintenance by the required authorities, we see what the current condition of this ghat is. Uh, talking about social vulnerabilities, we do have, you know, um, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, local people kind of occupying this space. But of course, they don't have the knowledge of how such a heritage space is to be used. So whenever we go there, you know, they are always kind of, you know, doing some or the other activity, which is structurally kind of not, uh, which is structurally invasive, I would say. They've been, you know, cooking inside the ghat. They've kind of made random extensions to the ghat just for their own, uh, you know, purposes. Some of one part of the ghat is actually shut off because, you know, that is not that is meant for uh, how do I put it? But for people to drink and smoke because this is, like I said, this is not the most accessible ghat or because not many people know about it. And also, if you look at the staircases, actually, just the structure of the staircases in such a way, it itself makes it a very uh, vulnerable uh, uh, structure because of the moving river which continuously kind of hits the staircase um, and second and thirdly the institutional vulnerability is also one thing that we have noticed that due to lack of we, we have this plaque which was put in again a very uh, personally it looks a, it, it's a very ugly kind of a plaque that they've just put to men mention that this is a grade one uh, heritage monument but then they literally do nothing about it. And whenever we question them, they're all like, okay, one part of it belongs to Portra. Someone says one part of it belongs to KMC. So there's always this fight between stakeholders. And so another aspect that while we have seen the structural kind of vulnerabilities uh, that, that are there, which the river causes, one thing that we are kind of missing out right now is also the chemical components of the water, because, you know, which something that we will also hear later on is that the river water itself contains certain chemicals, which is maybe invasive. I'm not too sure because I don't have that background. But one thing, since it's a you know work in progress, one thing that we definitely want to engage in or understand is also to see that what are the chemical properties in this water that may affect uh, this building in a negative way and how do we probably cater to that because often at times as architects we kind of you know miss on that aspect um we will now go to our second case study which is the kumatuli ghat so i'll invite shohini again to kind of give a brief um, introduction to this ghat yes uh, so the kumatuli ghat this was also built around that 19th century and interesting facts about this ghat is that uh, it's it is just beside the kumatuli para as we all know that this para is very much famous for uh, its idol makers so all our idols for duga puja or any kind of puja comes from this uh, so this kumatuli ghat structure it mainly consists of 20 columns and ik six on each side there's a on entering we see that there is a ritual room changing room and beside that there is a uh, police room and that cafe so yes uh, and also there is a paved area where people can sit and enjoy um obhirup what do you want to uh, extend obhirup bera what do you want to uh, uh, extend on the architectural features Yes, sir. Now, uh, first, uh, what we see is on the plan, uh, there are two flights going down to the banks of the river, just like how we have seen in Mollikhat, but here it is much broader. And uh, what Shoini just said, there is also a changing area, a temple, a area for worship and a police room. And the police room is no longer in use now. And uh, there, I have there we have seen a cafeteria, and uh, the structure is most very similar to Nath Mandir of Hindu temples. And many elements have been taken from uh, Hindu temples as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think when we when we go to these sites and we try to kind of uh, you know document these sites we also try to draw inspiration from maybe how did the 
whoever commissioned this how did they probably come up with the idea and i think this was one design that you know was very relevant at in that particular late 19th century uh, period uh, you know uh, where people would kind of just have a little bit of a courtyard area something very similar to the rashmon show which is a very famous kind of architectural feature in bengal temples and i think that is what they kind of try to do colonnade structures which is open so that you know there's a good view but also it's shaded so that one can you know dress and change and everything uh, but the reason we selected Kumartuli Ghat was also because of the intangible significance of it. As Shohini mentioned that Kumartuli Para, which is uh, one of the most famous kind of areas in Calcutta, where all the idols are still made out of clay, um, unlike other cities where, you know, plaster of Paris have come in. This is actually one of the Ghats uh, where the clay is actually collected. The clay that is collected from the river is actually collected on this Ghat and it's taken up from on these stairs, which is why the stairs are actually much broader than the other um, uh, ghats that that we generally notice um, i don't know why the why there was a difference in the orientation because i somehow feel that maybe if, if it was a longitudinal you know flight of stairs which is the case in other ghats it probably would have been easier but you know one never knows but when we talk as as architects or as heritage professionals when we when we talk about you know the involvement of intangible cultural heritage in such um, you know heritage sites we often tend to romanticize it and we often try to tell that okay, that's very important, it's the most important aspect of um, that particular structure or that particular uh, site. But I also look at it from a very critical angle because people who basically carry the clay are you know, not again aware of uh, the significance of this building site and they actually carry it in any way possible, which is often actually uh, you know, invasive to the site because if we actually go to the site, we'll see that deposits of mud that has fallen over the years have often covered huge spot, huge you know patches of the ground uh, in inside inside the ghat other than that there is a use of you know bamboos which is used kind of to put you know pick up the uh, clay and things like that and these and they have no idea how to control that bamboo so as a, as a person when i've seen these people kind of you know do it uh, we've almost noticed that the way they carry the bamboo, it touches the, it kind of, you know, chips the break, it kind of, you know, uh, hits the column. But, you know, they are not really aware because uh, there is no awareness about what the significance of these things are. So while I, I'm not saying that we should actually absolutely stop these, uh, you know, uh, events happening, we, of, we have to also look at it from a critical way and, f and document that aspect as well. That while there are certain events, people take, you know, take bath and come change here these ghats are often used for a lot of rituals so there is a very um you know uncontrolled use of fire uncontrolled use of uh, flowers and things like that which are often you know kind of dumped in any way possible again there is a lot of chemical uh, you know uh, relevance of these aspects for example the deposition of soot or maybe the uh, uh, decayed flowers that are just dumped towards towards the corner of the room now how does that affect uh, the building. So the documentation strategy looks at ways to document, uh, ways to kind of mark those things as well, so that wh whoever is kind of studying or looking at the conservation process is very well aware that, you know, what are the things to be taken care of and how is the water aspect kind of relevant um, here as well. Since, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ghat was, of course, the pilot project, but since we had the framework and we were from the Living Waters Museum, we were looking at a very overarching kind of uh, stories on different uh, sto uh, different water structures or water stories in in, Cal in Calcutta. We thought that why don't we also use this framework uh, for another structure which is kind of different. And this one is the Panioti uh, fountain, which was constructed in 1898 um, by Lord Curzon uh, in you know for this gentleman called Dimitris Panioti, who was a Greek uh, trader and was a friend of the East India Company. Um, interestingly, there is we've, we've really tried hard, but there is no evidence of the fountain itself. Uh, but we've kind of, you know, uh, we just have the structure, even if we go back to 1902, uh, which is probably the last image uh, that we see here, uh, you know, there is no evidence of the fountain itself. So while people still call it the Panioti fountain, we never know that, you know, if this was actually a drinking water fountain or how it looked. But we, it is still a water heritage structure and a water heritage structure that does not have water right now, which is also another category that we kind of very uh, relevantly put that it's not necessary that every water heritage structure needs to have water. But then there are, of course, different 
um, ideas of of conserving it, of restoring it back to its past glory, because at the current at current times it looks somewhat like this. It is a great risk because if you see the uh, uncontrolled growth of you know fauna around it, this and Calcutta being a very you know prone to cyclones, any tree might just fall on this on any day and due to pounding can affect the structure structurally. Uh, we already see that you know uh, the roof has already been damaged and there has not been much work done socially since this is just kind of a you know a little shade this is used by homeless people to just come and cook like you notice uh, so we've kind of documented it architecturally which we will now forward to um, authorities and so that they can kind of look up look at the restoration bit of it but we also have to maintain we have to also look at the fact that this is made of marble and the water content of in of Calcutta particularly is very rich in in water in in very rich in iron. So you know even when we restore it, we have to probably put up these elements that since it's marble, we need to kind of take care that you know the water is very is drained is in a very right way or we have proper filters so that it doesn't stain the material itself. Again, bringing in the linkage of water itself with uh, the structure. So these are kind of things that we are trying to do um, with uh with the thought process that you know uh, nupur devashrita uh, and I, myself we had and we're trying to test it uh, this is of course um uh, you know a work in progress and we are trying to kind of uh, fill in the gaps that we still have so i would uh, really want to take advantage of this uh, of this platform to kind of take note of uh, what you feel about it and uh, how do you think we can uh, take this take this forward Nupur, do you want to add any? Uh, so these are uh, just to add, you know, these are archival images that we found of uh, the Panioti fountain. The image at the bottom is a, is a cinematic reference from Satyajit Ray's film Porosh, Porosh Pathur, where um, this structure was used as a bus stop. Uh, so we found some archival images, but again, no reference to the fountain itself. Um, so Nupur, would you want to add to uh, this and take it forward? Um, actually, it's like um, as, uh, if you guys could see the screenshots of the documentation framework, that's mostly how the framework is in the state right now. And that's exactly how we're taking it to different sites. And I think uh, through the case studies, we're able to understand better. So thank you for that. Uh, so that um, that's mostly it from our side. We actually just wanted to put these other reference images that we were able to create out of AI when we were trying to understand what, what the heritage is for AI uh, with respect to the Indian uh, context. Um, okay. So um, since we are kind of, you know, towards the end of our presentation, I would like to take this opportunity to actually thank all the students who have, you know, who have had a very busy schedule, uh, but they kind of managed to finish things uh, by this morning and kind of say that, no, we have to present things uh, uh, today. So I would really want to thank Obhirup Shomeshwar, Shohini, Vishari, Shomili, uh, two Shomilis, Karina, Paromita, Shubradeep, Shuchishmita, and Pritam. And also thank Devashita Kundu, who is, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the conservation architect, who's been guiding them in best practices of documentation as well. So I would really want to, like, kind of, you know, uh, thank you all for, um, you know, bearing with us and also kind of being a part of this entire process of learning. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sukrit. Thank you, Nupur. And thank you, uh, all the people who presented, the students who, uh, who have been able to finish the work uh, by yesterday, as I understand, and uh, were managed this morning. Uh, managed, yeah, this morning. <laughs> and and uh, were able to present it. This was really nice to see all these graphics together, uh, along with these archival references uh, to, to basically look at uh, water architecture. And uh, I think, uh, the potential to develop uh, this framework is very interesting, and and thank you also for sticking to the uh, time frame as well. Uh, this is really much appreciated. So, uh, so uh, if if anybody has any questions from the audience before uh, uh, we can further reflect, uh, I would really like to invite all of you to please, uh, if you have any queries about the framework, about uh, the work which was presented just now. Uh, if you any um, comment you would like to make, also contribute, please feel free to uh, let me know or message me or speak up, please. Nishant Munami would be speaking, right? 
yeah yeah i mean uh, we we let her uh, i think uh, uh, i think she needs to wrap up the session we are not uh, we are still at the question answers round yeah in that case i have a question thank you for the lovely presentation and i think uh, excellent excellent graphics and uh, uh, i have a question one to nupur and one to sukrit of course nupur with for you you know you said that uh, you're not really making uh, something like a new framework but you are really trying to test the established framework right uh, is something that uh, that you said now my my concern is that uh, when we look at the water heritage structures like or even the structures you know which where water have like for instance agrasen ki bauli or we look at suraj kund or we look at uh, even humayun's tomb which has got a lovely water infrastructure uh, sadly you know we have sort of uh, uh, messed up with the existing framework and hence the whole framework has become like a non functional kind of a thing so are you also going to recommend something to uh, to make them functional or you are just going to sort of report what is existing so that's a question to you and uh, i can come to sukrit later maybe you can respond okay i i i'm really sorry i think um, i got misunderstood actually what i wanted to say was that we're not creating a new framework out of nothing what i actually wanted to say was that we are using the existing frameworks which doesn't mean that just an architectural documentation framework because uh, for example planners have their own documentation framework whenever they go to water like whenever they're mapping water resources in during their uh, planning documentation similarly um, nature conservation professionals have a different uh, documentation framework whenever they approach say a water body like a lake or a river so uh, what i meant to say was that we have used these uh, documentation frameworks in existing disciplines and try to combine them to create something which is specifically focused on documenting water heritage as a complete uh, site not specifically looking at the site as a water resource for planners or as a historical building for architects or conservation architects so uh we very correctly mentioned about agrasen ki bauli actually because out of the examples that we saw here um one main point about agus in kibali is that the water element itself is missing but uh, it becomes a very nice case study because if we actually sat down to use this uh, documentation framework understand the existing situation of the bauli compare it to a bauli within the same region say uh, rajon ki bauli in delhi which has water and try to understand the development that has happened around it we would actually be able to understand why the water element meant missing and this is exactly why we are doing this we're trying to understand how we can keep this water element how we can conserve the natural elements associated with it how we can uh, conserve the social and the intangible cultural heritage associated with it but within one form so uh, i think it's it's correct to say that it's a new form but uh, it's not a form coming out of thin air you know it's something which is based on research of the existing documentation processes used by people from different disciplines i hope that answers i think mansi has raised her hand so maybe mansi thank you uh, thank you uh, nupur and sukrit for the wonderful presentation most importantly to have an inclusive presentation where students also could see how their work gets discussed and you know debated and maybe a step further deliberated with the local authorities and society uh, at large uh, my question to uh, both of you you may choose either one of you answer or both of you to answer when we do these kind of uh, or narratives come documentation which is also a science and it is more on the citizen science side of it um, do you think our local authorities are now ready to use these repositories or do they have any system in place for themselves um, to really use these uh, documentations for further in or you know regeneration improvisation restoration conservation preservation you can name any of these concepts here yeah, because these are good reference points because they are not investing time and energy to do this 
So if if organizations like LWM or ICOMOS or any individual or uh, uh, individually done organizations are doing this documentation, how do we see uh, to make use of them in future? Uh, apart from learning, of course, to really bring uh, the change which we are really foreseeing. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, uh, if I can come in, I think uh, access sure. to this uh, data is quite yes, uh, important. I think how we uh, figure out that this uh, this can be well curated, can, can be accessed and by the people who can take it up because I mean, there are several organizations who have a CSR budget and funding who would like to perhaps take and revive it, but they just don't have access to what is uh, there. Yeah, Sukhjit, yes, please. So, yeah, I, I totally agree with uh, Nishant. I, I am a, like, as a person, I'm very optimistic in that way. And I do feel that, yes, people are ready to be able to use it. Uh, I personally, you know, as, as, a, as an individual, I always feel that we try to promote these places as something that's dying or something that's crumbling. And this is also the case with, you know, our earth. You know, when we talk about climate change, we often talk about our earth is dying, we need to save it. We often forget to tell how beautiful it is. And I think this is the same approach that we might we should take with these ghats because the current the current understanding of these whenever because we've been speaking to certain people and ask them that you know would you like to go out to this ghat for maybe a trip or would you want to like go to the ghat and sit down the basic answer particularly if it's a woman she would say that no I don't feel very safe going there because it's a place where miscreants have occupied it or you know people are smoking or drinking so I don't find it as a as a space you know which is very positive to go and spend some time. But personally, when I go to these places, I, f I feel that these places have the potential to become very, very amazing tourist spots. And the idea is not to shoo these people out. The idea is to kind of, you know, um, you know, that fill filling up the cup with positive things to kind of, you know, uh, uh, neutralize the negatives that are there. And that is happening. So, for example, I would just like to take a real life example, which happened with the Panioti fountain is we, we have a group of, you know, heritage enthusiasts in like in Calcutta, you know, so we just shared that what was the current condition of uh, this, um, this monument and, you know, what happened. And in fact, the student who went with me actually had malaria because it was all flooded uh, when we went, unfortunately. And this is something that I had to message saying that, you know, I went with a student to document it and guess what? She had malaria because that is how inaccessible these sites are, how dangerous these sites are. Within two months, that, that forest was actually clear. It's if you, we go go to that space right now, it is clear. So definitely, people are there who are hearing. We just need to find right ways to tell them. And I think these frameworks are definitely very technical. But we need to find maybe I don't like to use the word soft, but we need to kind of use more democratic ways to uh, reach out to the audience and tell them why this space is beautiful and why this space requires your footprint to come and engage in positive activities. I think that is what I would I would like to kind of uh, say that way. If that answers your question. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Um, if I may also invite uh, Monami Bhattacharya, who has been with us, the young discussant, to reflect on the points made by the speakers. Monami is a mixed method researcher trained in qualitative and quantitative research with on field experiences, hoping to contribute to the world of research and academia. Um, her research interest lies in understanding climate adaptation, water stress, sustainability, gender resilience, among others. She has worked as a consultant to the Department of Education, Government of Tamil Nadu. Uh, she has also been part of a project on uh, stubble burning and its impact undertaken by the Ministry of Environment um, of uh, West Bengal. She has interned with several organizations on environmental issues. She has completed her postgrad MA from TIS Hyderabad in natural resource and governance and her bachelor's in geography from Loreto College, uh, Kolkata. So her master's thesis highlights understanding the impact of environmental change on the rickshaw pullers of Kolkata. And I think it will be, uh, it's, it's kind of perfect uh, in a way because what I understood from Sukrit and Nupur that uh, they were looking for some collaborator who had this part of, uh, I mean, uh, capacity. And uh, uh, because it's a very interdisciplinary approach and I think uh, often one comes uh, as an architect, uh, I think one has a focus uh, uh, somehow or the other on the built aspect. And uh, even though uh, the team has really clearly transcended that, uh, I think uh, so. Munami, please, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for that introduction. 
Uh, first of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank both Nupur and Sukrit for their wonderful presentation. It was a really fascinating uh, conversation that we were having. So, uh, primarily, I want to pitch in one question here. You all have been talking about documenting the water heritage sites. So, as a youth of today, when I uh, I come from Kolkata, so when I walk down the Gan the lanes by the Ganges. I often uh, come across certain historical structures and which is evident by the structure that it is. But again, I am ignorant of the fact that it has a historical significance and I do not know where to approach and who to approach to understand what exactly the impact it has. So uh, what would you all suggest that uh, if youth like me would like to contribute in this sphere, we observe certain structures but then we don't know what to do with the information and what to like how to go about it. What would you all suggest that we do in this case? Nupur, would you want to take that up? Um, I think yeah, I, I can give part of the idea, but I think you could give a more uh, location-based answer, like <laughs> because if she's actually walking along the streets, uh, along the banks of uh, the river. I think you can give more design <laughs> related solutions. But what I actually wanted to say was that this is something we're actually hoping that if this framework goes pub uh, like uh, goes online on the public portal of Ecomas India and uh, Living Waters Museum page, it's definitely available for uh, professionals of all these disciplines to actually just uh, download the form and use it. But what we're actually hoping to create is that there can be some form, some. Um, some manner of storage or some form of repository where whoever uses this form to document a certain structure, that data can also be stored. Again, being available to all, like this is something that's a separate discussion. But what I'm actually hoping is that, for example, you see the structure and you know a certain information about it. Certain attributes of this documentation framework can be answered by you. Similarly, when you post it there on that framework and somebody else notices, okay, there's something like this, maybe I know more about the chemical aspects of it, maybe I should go and check it out, or somebody just happens to read or is already working on a similar project. It's something that will, of course, it needs much more uh, public awareness in that sense. But what we're trying to really work towards and hope is that this can be something which is more readily accessible for people. And it becomes, this itself becomes the, the tool to answer your question itself, you know, like if this information is filled by you and somebody else reads this information about that particular ghat, they also get to know more about it. So, um, for example, if this ghat of Kolkata project, all the details are available online and you want to know more about a particular ghat that you are walking by, this repository is available for you to actually go download the form, understand what, what the... Uh, historical information about that structure is, but more importantly, what are the social and natural elements associated with it currently? Yeah. Um, Sukrit, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think, uh, but also to your question, um, I would kind of say that the framework um, acts as a second stage uh, because first we need to know what is the site. And that information already actually exists in places like Water Atlas or, you know, things like that. In fact, in fact, in fact Ecomos India was also working on a development of um, um, a, a huge kind of a <clears throat> list of water heritage structures everywhere. So we need to probably find ways to incentivize it as in if I go through across a structure and, you know, I see a water heritage structure and I see that can I maybe just by clicking a picture and saying whether the water exists or not. As simple, something as simple as that. You know, and you just put up a picture and something like Wikipedia where anyone can, uh, you know, upload things. But of course, there has to be a continuous check. And um, but I think the, I think answering to the question that when you said that you often go to these sites and don't know about it. I think the first thing is we need to start going there. Because once you start going there, and that is what I tell all these students and you know, whoever is working uh, with us, that let's just actually just go to this place and spend some time. Because if we don't go to this place, we, we won't ask questions about this place. And social media plays a very important role here, particularly as youth. And we've seen how, uh, you know, um, uh, mo how we can mobilize social media, uh, how we can use social media to raise funds. And it has happened where we just put up a photo saying that this has this relevance, this has, uh, this is related to this person, should not be, should we not be talking about it? And even if people submit like 50 bucks towards it, and 
if we actually get in like you know 500 people submitting 50 bucks we have enough money to money to kind of take ownership of that space and that is exactly the kind of approach that we are trying to take here that let's actually you know kind of make it a community centric restoration work uh, start in in these parts of the city and you know that's what we're working towards so we should just start talking about it first that's the easiest and then comes the more technical things like this framework which is which is probably be going to be useful for people who are going to restore the place or probably going to understand it you know students want to understand the structure in a more uh, detailed manner but the main idea is to really kind of re-establish the relationship of um, of if it's a built heritage structure to kind of re-establish the relationship of the built heritage structure with the water itself so uh, thank you very much for that answer uh, i have another question to add to this so uh, we could un understand how the youth can be reached but considering a huge population of our city if we are talking about kolkata is illiterate so how do you propose that the common man of our society can also be sensitized so that everyone can come forward and folklore can actually also be like captured in this entire process. Um, if I may answer that, um, I think I mentioned that, you know, there are these spaces are often referred to as negative spaces because of the activities that are there. And I'm sure as a citizen of the city, you are also aware of the kind of activities that happen in these cards, particularly after sunset. And I also did mention that although these negative uh, kind of activities will remain, we have to kind of, uh, you know, neutralize that with positive activities and things like that also happen. So as youths, we just need to probably go there and, you know, what we do often on Sundays is we just go to a ghat early in the morning and you play some music or, you know, in the evening, we just go there and have discussions. Just in January last this year, we had something called the River Festival, which happened on four of these ghats where people just went and painted on the stairs of the ghats. And that actually brought people from different backgrounds, from different age groups to just come and understand what's happening. And that is exactly the kind of things that we need to do that, you know, to bring people. And as youth, you know, something that we like to do instead of doing it in an AC air conditioned hall, let's just do it on the ghat. And it's actually pretty easy to get permissions because the police or everyone, they are cooperative. And if you make them understand what we're trying to do, they are very okay with us doing it unless it's of course disturbing another event that's happening. So these initiatives always help and it is helping. I do see after the, after the river festival happened, I think one of the rotary clubs came forward and uh, provided money to restore that cart where we, where that happened. Uh, but yeah, I think that's the idea. You just bring people and things will automatically start happening. It might not be a very fast process, but it will definitely happen. So, and we are young, we have time. So sure. <laughs> Thank you very much for your responses. Uh, honestly speaking, this was a first time idea that uh, was brought out and I had no idea that water heritage can also be documented. So this was a very good learning experience for me. I'm really grateful to all the members over here who gave me this opportunity and uh, thank you again. Fantastic. So uh, over to I would hand over to Fozia, please, for or Mansi, whichever, which whoever would like to take it up, please. Okay, I Thank will you. just shift Sorry, on my mobile right now. Sorry, let no. Mansi take over. I think she has some uh, yeah. announcements also. So yeah. yes, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Nishant, for the wonderful session uh, we had today, and especially to look at how the younger generation is really trying to bring citizen science uh, into action to bring some change which are really required now high time, not only in wa uh, water, but people and places uh, and intangible aspects of it. And uh, definitely thanks to Nishan and ICOMOS uh, for really agreeing to do this series. We have still many sessions to go with you people. So, and we are looking forward to it. Before I conclude, I also wish to thank all the participants who have been attending our session so far. Uh, to reach the 100th session and we are grateful to all our supporters so far and last but not the least uh, many thanks to the team members who have been there from day one including uh, Kozia who is here today who have been working uh, I must say you know we don't do much uh, communication but the work is flowing as just like water so a deep gratitude to my team who have brought this uh, milestone to reach and before we close, I would like to announce our 
Friday water session, which is this week, day after tomorrow on 23rd of June, and we are having water art session. And the session is with a very well-known uh, speaker, writer, orator in radio, TV, many documentaries you may have seen in National Geographic Discovery Channel, Mr. Subodh Mishra. And the session is going to be on Hindi, and it will be on Hath Dholo. And that's a animation which is made by, from for many languages across the world. The next week, Wednesdays for Water, is our scientific session, and that's on June 28th. And we are doing all the sessions at 5 p.m., so I often forget to mention the time, 5 p.m. IST. Uh, do join us for discussing urban rivers. Uh, integrated Water Resource Management, where we have experts from NIUA and SEPT University to take the conversation on uh, this subject. So it's a riverscape subject, but we are extending it more into getting uh, more policymakers and academicians talk about it uh, through their lenses. So thank you all of you. Once again, I am really grateful to the entire team as well as all the participants we have. I guess we have had more than... I think 10,000 participants who have attended our session so far. And we are really looking forward to going every Wednesday and Wednesday and Wednesday, at least till August, we have our sessions lined up. So I can promise uh, until August, we have been taking baby steps in it. So no big plans, but baby steps have worked well. So two and a half years nearly. So we hope to go stronger with every Wednesday and every Friday, as well as every Monday. Thank you so much, all of you. Please take care of yourself and bye-bye.